Welcome everyone to Pontus Fathom Press. This is our Pontus Fathom podcast, episode number 35, and we're talking about the Mother of Dragons, the original Mother of Dragons, um, not a Game of Thrones reference. We're really talking about Tiamat, the, uh, the ancient um, world dragon from uh, Mesopotamian uh, mythologies. And you can find Tiamat across Babylonian, Akkadian, uh, uh, Anunnaki even types of uh, uh, mythologies. So we're going to deep dive into the nature of the dragon. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the dragon uh, is interpreted as chaos and all these myths of slaying the dragon and maybe what's that about really something on the uh, maybe on the transformative side or the world building side and we'll lean back into our last podcast we talked uh, in, uh, in podcast 34 we did a, a send up to uh, dragons in George R.R. R. Martin and Elric of Mel Nibine and in um, in in J.R.R. Tolkien and, 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 and a quick summary of that podcast if you guys haven't watched it but a quick summary of that one is um, it's interesting how Tolkien the dragons are still much more godlike and by the time we get down to Martin they've really become more like uh, feral animals but very in tune and still animals with lots of lore and uh, connected to magic but just in a subtler way and even in the Elric saga uh, the last of the dragons, right? We, all of these stories sort of wrap up this concept of the last of the dragons. So we'll kind of dig into that uh, mythology a little bit for, f further. If you guys didn't listen to that podcast, go and check that out. And, uh, and then we'll also talk a little bit about this bloodline of the dragon, right? So the idea of Dragul and also even some Christian myths around uh, the dragon bloodline. So we'll We'll reach into that a bit. We're going to be doing dragons for a, a number of weeks here. It seems like there's a lot of interesting stuff. The more I deep dive into this, we'll talk a little bit about Steiner, a little bit about Jung. We'll even dabble into a bit of tarot. But before we start, a uh, quick shout out to Pontos Fathom Press uh, Publications. We've got the Giuseppe Balsamo Disclosure from Necrono Necronomicon Fragment Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Necromancy of Nyarlathotep, Hermeticism of Hastur. They are both out and available uh, on lulu.com, on amazon.com, so you can go check those out. Alchemy of Azathoth coming up by the end of the year. It's in proof now, working on um, editing that. Uh, we've also got our uh, Moldenhauer's Artificial Psychology of Desiring Machines, Impedance and Admittance in Desiring Machines, Volume 1, is already out. Psychoanalysis of Artificial Intelligence and Computational Complexity in Psychiatric Agency. They'll be coming out uh, next year, so look forward to those. If you want previews of any of these, go over to our Patreon and you can check them out. And finally, the, the new project that, I, that's, that I'm really kind of excited on, and for those of you that have been following the podcast, uh, we're, uh, I've put together a three-volume set of... The podcast lectures. So I've actually turned each of the podcasts, our first year of podcasts, and broken them out into volumes one, Jungian Alchemy and Horror in Science Fiction, H.P. Lovecraft, Frank Herbert, and Philip K. Dick. Uh, next volume is Theosophical Psychoanalysis of Pulp Fantasy and Anime, where we talk about Conan, Solomon Kane, uh, John Carter of Mars, uh, Evangelion, and Bleach uh, anime manga. And then finally, the third volume, Esoteric Anthroposophy and Occulted History, uh, Giordano Bruno, Tolkien, Kubo, and the concepts of Saturn, time, Atlantis, karma. So a lot of that going on. Uh, these are in the works. If you guys want a sneak peek into those, check out our Patreon. And as always, you can check out our link, links below. So let's, uh, let's jump into it. The first, uh, first stop on our tour, I believe we're going to go back to um, just take a little look at the reading of the... Um, Anunnaki Babylonian uh, myth of, of Marduk and Tiamat. And just to give you guys the um, sort of the framework of this, maybe what we'll start with for the framework is to take a look at this geneolo geneolo genealogical chart. So if we start out with this uh, Anunnaki and the Dragon Queens uh, genealogical chart, let's see if we can zoom into this to make it clear. Uh, you can see here at the top, you've got Tiamat, the dragon queen of the Anunnaki, and she uh, mates with Apsu, the lord of the waters. 
And then from there, they have uh, a number of children, including Lamu and Lahamu, uh, which are described uh, uh, differently. But the idea of, interestingly, the idea of Tiamat in Apsu in one way is that Apsu uh, is the fresh water. And Tiamat as the dragon, in some, some traditions, she's seen of as the salt water of the ocean. So you have this idea of the fresh water and the salt, wa salt water. And then two of these children are actually the muddied waters, right? So the idea of the mud coming up. And then from there, earth, sky, you know, we get uh, Ki and Anu come. And then Marduk becomes the, the children of Enki down, down, the, down the family tree a bit. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, we have this idea also of Tiamat, uh, Primarily, people think of Tiamat as kind of like the primordial chaos, right? So if we do the parallels to, say, the Greeks, uh, Theogony, right? You sort of have in the, in, in the, in the, the earliest proto-gods are like night and fear and chaos and the, and the lifeless sea. And I think this is the same, this is a similar uh, resonance with the, um, with the uh, Anunnaki line. But then what's very interesting though with, with all of these myths, and we see this uh, creatively emerge even in the modern fictions where this concept of uh, slaying of the dragon, right? So we always get to this slaying of the dragon concept. And I'm just curious about this. So let's first talk a little bit about the slaying of a dragon, then we can kind of go into it. It says, uh, this, this quick reading here it says, Thou, Marduk, art most honored of the great gods. Thy decree is unrivaled. Thy word is Anu. And from this day unchangeable shall be the pronouncements. To raise or to bring low. These shall be thy hand. And having placed in the midst of a great cloth, they address themselves to Marduk, their firstborn. Lord, truly thy decree is among, first among gods. Say but to wreck or create, it shall be. Open thy mouth and the cloth will vanish. Speak again and the cloth shall be whole. Joyfully did they homage. Marduk is king. They conferred on him scepter, throne, and vestment, and gave him the matchless weapons that ward off foes. Go and cut off the life of Tiamat. May the winds bear her blood to places undisclosed. And then Tiamat and Marduk, wisest of gods, joined issue. They strove in single combat, locked in battle. Marduk the Lord spread out his net to enfold her. The evil wind that followed behind, he let loose in her face. And when Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove in the evil wind that she closed not her lips. As the fierce wind charged her belly, and her body was distended, and her mouth was wide open. He released the arrows, it tore her belly and it cut through to her inside, splitting the heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguished her life, and he cast her carcass to stand upon it. And after he had slain Tiamat the leader, her band was shattered. Her troop was broken up. And we see even in, in, in some of the later mythologies, and even, I believe, uh, we, see, we see that uh, uh, Jung addresses this. Uh, we see that... Uh, Jung addressing it, here we have a cover here, photo of St. Michael slaying the dragon, right? Which is another motif. The slaying the dragon motif comes up, and maybe it comes all the way back from this Marduk dragon slaying. But what I find kind of curious to this is, okay, there is this idea of ritual slaying of the dragon to uh, create the world, right? So this idea of, I think Jung has it in his... Uh, black books we talked about in the last lecture if you want to go check that out but the idea is the dream is of the dragon and the droplets of blood of the dragon and the plants spring up from the dragon's body so this there is a sort of um, uh, rites of spring type of the seasons uh, mythology to it but what's interesting too is the saint george mythology from which a lot of the tolkien and uh, I want to say George R. R. Martin and even the Elric saga, sort of that that dragon slayer type of thinking. It seems to be curious to me. It's like why why kill the dragon, right? So and I know that in in the in the Christian tradition, maybe we see the dragon somewhat as a demon or as Christ, right? So we see here that 
This work is to let the pi up pow Michael power, this is from uh, Rudolf Steiner's Archangel My Michael, the Michael power and the Michael will are none other than the Christ will and the Christ power. And if this Michael power is able verily to overcome all that is of the demon and the dragon, and you will know well what that is. If you all who have in this way received the Michael thought in the light, have indeed received it with true and faithful heart and with tender love, you will endeavor to go forward from the Michael mood of this year until not only the Michael thought revealed in your soul, but you are able to make the Michael thought live in your deeds and in its strength and its power. And if this is so, then you will be true servants of the Michael thought, worthy helpers of what has now entered the earthly evolution through anthroposophy and to take there the meaning of Michael. So here we get a little insight into this Michael mystery from uh, Steiner's address. Uh, but I kind of want to think of it in an even a little bit different way because there is a lot of psychology packed into that, right? So the idea here is, uh, um, I'm thinking of, there's a uh, Saint-Michel Plaza in Paris and there's a, a great statue there of Michael uh, stepping on the devil as he does. But in this case, the devil is not a, in the form of a, of, a, of a dragon. It's in the form of a man. See, in this picture, it's kind of Michael slaying a dragon. But in the uh, Saint-Michel sculpture, the fountain, Michael steps on this, uh, you know, uh, writhing humanoid kind of looking devil. But on the sides flanking the, the, the fountain, on the two sides of the fountain, there are two dragons sort of standing guard. And this sort of imagery really kind of lends itself to maybe that same creative spirit that comes into the Tolkien reviving the dragon, you know, where we have Smaug talking to the Hobbit, right? This kind of a way to connect to the ancient wisdom. And even in George R. R. Martin's, I, I believe it's even a, while the dragons are diminished from Tolkien strength class, let's call it like that, they are increased in their accessibility and rideability by these Targaryens and Valerians who, who are the dragon, dragon masters, right? So I, I, I kind of think that that's a very interesting um, uh, direction to go in. And uh, to keep going with this sort of psychological alchemical one, there's um, some idea here of Nicholas Flamel, uh, who uh, first, well, let's first kind of go into it through Jung. So in Jung's Mysterious Conjunctionis, he talks about the, um, the Ouroboros, right? And he says, Venus is undoubtedly the armor sapentiae who puts check on the sulfur's revolving charms. The latter may well derive from the fact that the seat of the Ouroboros is the tail of the dragon. Sulfur is the masculine e e element par excellence, the sperma, sperma homogeneum. And since the dragon is said to impregnate himself by the Ouroboros, and I have a picture here of the Ouroboros from the tarot card. So the Ouroboros and the tarot card, we can just see it as the snake, right? Uh, like Bella, who engulfed her brother in her own body and dissolved him into atoms, the dragon devours himself from the tail upwards until his whole body has been swallowed into his head. Being the inner fire of Mercurius, Sulphur obviously partakes in his most dangerous and most evil nature, his violence being personified in the dragon and the lion, and his con con concupiscence in Hermes Selenius, the dragon whose nature, Sulphur, shares it's often spoken as the dragon of Babel, or more accurately, the dragon's head, Caput Draconis, which is a most pernicious poison, a poisonous vapor breathed out by the flying dragon. The dragon, however, the winged dragon that comes to stand for Quicksilver becomes a poison-breathing monster only after its union with the wingless dragon, which corresponds to sulfur. Right, so you have a dragon eating a dragon, right? And they say that his head lives in eternity, therefore is called glorious life, and the angels serve him. And this is a reference to Matthew 4.11. Then the devil laveth him, and behold, angels come and ministered unto him. Hence we get the peril of the dragon's head with Christ. Okay, now this is where we get it, right? We get the dragon's head and an indication of Christ, which seems counterintuitive from the... A Christian perspective, right? We, we often would think of um, the dragon as not being a Christ-like symbol. So let's go back into the rings. Uh, ring board. This is a Lawrence Gardner's. I probably will do a, 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 a series of po podcasts on 
Lawrence Gardner's Bloodline of the Holy Grail. Maybe we'll take it all the way back to the book that inspired him, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Guys, leave a comment below if you're interested in that. But he's got Bloodlines of the Holy Grail, Genesis of the Grail Kings, and then Rings of the Realm of the Ring Lords. And this is a kind of like his, uh, I would say it's almost a master work in, um, it's a bit revisionist history, but it's also a bit of uh, uh, alchemical, uh, historical alchemical stuff inspired by the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, maybe uh, Messianic, Messianic legacy. So maybe, guys, let me know if you want me to go into these. I can, I can do a, a deep dive into these as a, as a separate piece after we finish our dragon uh, phase. But So he starts out here talking about the uh, this idea of uh, Mary Magdalene going to France, right? The Albigen has been identified with water. The Albigen, which is the Albigensian crusade, the Cathar. The Albigen have been identified with water, a concept that can, can be traced back some five millennia to Tiamat, the dragon queen. Her Akkadian name means the salt waters, as we talked about before, and has its equivalent in the Hebrew, Telom. Uh, it also means the raging sea. Awake, O arm of the Lord. Art that now that hath cut rabid and wounded the dragon from Isaiah. Uh, it was a common theme in the writings of the Mesopotamians that the respective deities was, was calming of the wild ocean. This was like a, a quality of a god. Only the god, god can calm the, uh, the oceans. And you see this with the idea of um, the dragon and the dragon tamer, right? Again, we see this dragon and the dragon tamer. And this leads us also into the things of perhaps even the idea of the Holy Grail, which is the idea of that quest where you have to regulate yourself to find that quest. And we can go into that uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe beyond the dragon talk, but we can talk about that when we go into these uh, Grail books. It's quite, quite fascinating uh, topic as well. Uh, the, the next point here to, to call out, though, is uh, when we're talking about this as a bloodline now, uh, we can go back to uh, Jung here. And he again, he brings up the uh, Babylonian fire and Nicholas Flamel even. Uh, but before we get to the Babylonian dragon, I just want to call out here to um, this is Edward Edinger's Mysterium Lectures. A uh, journey through Carl Jung's Mysterium Conjunctionis, and here we have a, a section that talks about. Uh, let's get into a bit the uh, just the nature of the alchemical uh, sequence in which the dragon plays. Right, so so we, we we kind of have this idea of the alchemy of um, dragon. And Jung is going to go into this and give us a little feeling for it. And then, then we're going to go back to Jung and we can talk about that Nicholas Flamel connection. But it says here, um, Jung gave a very nice resume of the alchemical color sequence at the beginning of the Mortificatio chapter in the Anatomy of Psyche. Let me repeat it here because it puts in a nutshell just what the alchemical colors mean psychologically. Uh, right at the beginning, you meet the dragon the chthonic spirit, the devil, or as the alchemists call it, the blackness, the negretto. And this encounter produces suffering. In the language of the alchemist, matter suffers until the negretto disappears, when the dawn, aurora, will be announced by the peacock tail, and a new day will break, the albedo. But in this state of whiteness, one does not live in the true sense of the word. It is just an abstract ideal state. In order to make it come alive, it must have blood. It must have what the alchemists call the rubedo, the redness of life. Only the total experience of being can transform this ideal state of the albedo into a fully human mode of uh, existence. Blood alone cannot reanimate the glorious state of the consciousness, in which the last traces of the blackness is dissolved, in which the devil is no longer autonomously existent, but rejoins the profound unity of the psyche, and then the opus magnum is finished, then the human soul is completely integrated. So here you see, this is a bit like the uh, Manichaean heresy again, right? We're back to the Manichaean heresy. So, and it, and it also echoes sort of in this uh, uh, bloodline of the of Tiamat 
you see on this bloodline, and there's a lot of bloodlines here, we actually see him tracing a bloodline of Tiamat through to, uh, through to Christ. So we, we actually see Christ on the family tree back to uh, Tiamat. And I'm just looking for the, we have Egyptian here out of Egypt. And Judea, the Fisher Kings, Jesus, right? So we have Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And she is perhaps a priestess also that goes all the way back through um, to um, Hexos and, uh, and earlier. Okay, so, so we've gotten a little bit of alchemy. We've gotten a little bit of um, the idea. And, and again, we talked about this Ouroboros. Uh, I'll go back into this idea of um, uh, the Babylonian dragon, where we're going to go back to Nicholas Flamel. So back to Jung again in the Mysterium Conjunctionis. So here he says, uh, the, so we're going to talk about more dragon imagery, right? But as far as the lion and lioness are the forerunners of the incestuous conjunctio, they come into category of those theeromorphic pairs who spend their time fighting and copulating. The cock and the hen, the two serpents of the caduceus, and the two dragons. The lion has, among other things, an unmistakable erotic aspect. Um, and it says, learn lastly what the caduceus of Mercury means. Uh, and I say in truth, the Babylonian dragon who kills all with his venom. Uh, but the Mercury Caduceus works its miracles, whose the nymphs hold enchanted if that would fulfill a wish, uh, the complement completion of the work. The reference to the Babylonish dragon is not altogether accidental, since the ecclesiastical language Babylon is thoroughly ambiguous. Nicholas Flamel likewise alludes to Babylon when he says that the stink and poisonous breath of burning Mercury as nothing other than the dragon's head Remember that same dragon's head that is related to Christ that has to be processed, right? It's a poison dragon's head that goes forth with great haste from Babylon, which is surrounded by two or three milestones, right? And that, um, that idea of the transformation of, of the, uh, uh, the dragon head of this poison is something very, it's a very interesting metaphor. And again, the dragon or the snake, the caduceus, here we have the two of discs from the tarot. And I just want to place that kind of between uh, the one of discs and the three of discs. And you see how we start out with that, that um, initial disc, is the, it's the world disc again. It's almost the Tiamat image. It's the world disc. It's the ocean surrounding the discs. It's Apsu, the fresh water within the disc or within the inner disc. And then um, the ace of discs, we move on to the three of discs on the other side of this, the three of discs on the other side. And we see the, um, the triangle now with three discs form that triangle, which has a, has a bit, of, bit of a UFO file feel to it, right? You've got the, the triangle with the three, um, three wheels of Three wheels of fortune. Now, or it's also a pyramid, though. If you look at it from above, it's a it's a pyramid. Is, is it a flying pyramid? We don't know. Uh, but interesting how this uh, dragon eating its tail sort of sits in the middle, and this is the change card as well. So this is the card that symbolizes change. So okay, we're deep into the uh, alchemy side. Thanks a lot for everyone for watching. Uh, feel free to comment below. Uh, really interested in turning this into a live stream. So. Um, let me know your thoughts below. I do read the comments and we'll get back to you uh, as I can. But let's jump into Nicholas Flamel for a bit. I've got a picture of him in this book here of Nicholas Flamel. Uh, and again, this is Jung was referencing Flamel in this idea of uh, his idea of the processing, the alchemical processing of the dragon. So in here we start talking about the, you know, Nicholas Flamel, who's known for the Philosopher's Stone. Um, it's sort of the idea of, really, it's, the, it's, it's really like the, the cornerstone of what 
uh, alchemy was about, right? This idea of philosopher's stone, uh, whether it's turning base metals to gold or some other kind of, uh, like as Jung would call it, this sort of transformation. This is the, the centerpiece of the royal arts of uh, alchemy. Uh, but there's also these terms of uh, uh, alchemy comes out of these traditions of, let's say, blacksmithing and farming and all this experimentation with smelting and, 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 and mining of materials out of the ground. And I think that some of this ends up, again, by, by season, while we're uh, planting our crops, the astrology of things come into play too, because there's certain seasons that you're digging up your fields, and I think this starts leading into that interconnectedness between uh, alchemy and some of the older arts, whether it's astrology, whether it's black blacksmiths, and also just the the hermetic view of the earth falling into these spaces. So, um, one of the first alchemical references that are kind of like a dragon concept uh, was uh, with the Greek reference in the Golden Fleece. So Jason. Uh, put dragon's teeth, much like Jung's dream, he planted dragon's teeth uh, to fight armed warriors, right? And that uh, these teeth would come up and become full, full warriors, basically, right? And this is sort of the idea of the, the, the golden fleece and its relation to alchemy and, and, and whatnot. So there's this Argonaut's golden fleece, but then there's also linking it back to the dragon. We have this Ouroboros link, right? So the idea is... Um, uh, there's a uh, Phaistos disc. The Phaistos disc. Do we have a picture of it here? The Phaistos disc. Um, I don't think we have a picture of it. So Nicholas Flamel going on again about this. Um, he's talking about the symbolism of the overlapping head in the Ouroboros. It's an eternal rebirth, right? So the idea here of that dragon core, that dragon heart. Um, I, I'm curious in this space because um, I'm wondering why, if at the same time the dragon is uh, linked to life, it's linked to alchemy, and the dragon core is part of a potentially part of a bloodline, why the urge to slay it? So we understand that there's the, you know, the death of the seasons, and we have this kind of programming, I'll call it. It's kind of a programming. But I just wonder if there's a creative way to think around it. In the last podcast, I was talking about uh, a bit of like imagining a more creative role of the dragon, right? So uh, when uh, Flamel talks about uh, the two dragons, we had in Jung talking about the two dragons, right? Uh, one of them is a dragon, one of them is a snake in Flamel. And Flamel writes, consider these two dragons for they're at the beginning of philosophy. And with the sages were not permitted to show their children. The one at the bottom is called the fixed in the concept, constant, or the man. And the upper snake is the volatile or the black, called the woman. And the first is called sulfur on the warm and dry, and the other is called quicksilver on the cold and moist. So this is a really an alchemical uh, formula here. And I think this leads us even into the Emerald Tablets of Hermes. This corresponds to a similar language, especially with the Phaistos disc and the idea of the Ouroboros here as well. So I, I think to go into the conjecture here then is to say, well, what, what else could it be? You know, so I think the last topic I kind of want to jump into is questioning of chaos, right? So the idea is, you know, we see this uh, in many of the modern takes, right? We see it in George Martin. And we'll see it in, uh, in Tolkien as well. You know, this idea of, uh, we'll see it in Tolkien as well, this idea of the dragon as, you know, the dragons of Tolkien are up in Angban, the iron prison in the Iron Mountains, and there are the forces of uh, Sauron uh, in the earlier ages. And we see that the Targaryens cursed with their cursed and blessed with their dragon riding, it also, always sort of pays a cost. And I think this sort of leads me back to the idea, well, if it's really chaos, is it really sacrificed? What are some, what are some um, other ways of thinking of this? You know, like I was thinking of it like almost in a, 
uh, like an inactive dreaming kind of way. Like, think of it this way. So, you know, you might have heard this, uh, this theory that maybe the asteroid belt used to be a planet, right? So imagine the asteroid belt used to be a planet, and we'll call that, and that planet was called Tiamat, okay? So if Tiamat used to be the, 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 the uh, planet after Mars, the planet between Mars and Jupiter could have been Tiamat, and then it was destroyed somehow by Marduk, let's call it, right? So where did the dragons go? Right? So you can have this kind of active imagination where you can say, well, let's make it a, like a, a fantasy novel. Let's say, well, some of the dragons came to Mars, some of the dragons came to the Earth, the rest of them went off to, say, I don't know, Saturn. And, uh, and what you found was the, the, um, the dragons uh, taken from their natural world were in some way domesticated. I mean, in some ways, it's the story of the fall of the dinosaurs, right? It's, it's the fall of the dinosaurs, you know, the, the terrible lizards, right? The, uh, and that's sort of the, the dragon as well. So we get that kind of boiled down to us even in, even in, the, uh, even in the evolutionary story. There's this concept of the dinosaur. And then finally, it's reduced even further from a dragon all the way down to just a snake, right? We see that snake under Mary's foot. We see the snake in the Garden of Eden. You know, so this, and then there's lots of research out there. You guys would be amazed if you go out and look at snake research and dragon research. A, a lot of it's very interesting. So I think here is a, here's a place where I like to diverge into this idea of, you know, why the myth of slaying the dragon, right? We, we see that, that a statue that I feel, that fountain there in Paris, where it's not a dragon that's underfoot. It's a, a humanoid devil. And then the dragons are standing by. So I, th I think the mythology that comes out of this, so let's call it the, um, let's call it a new uh, uh, meta instinct, right? Like, because we have this cultural artifact, we have this cultural programming that somebody has to slay the dragon to make the world. And, and, and then we have this other programming, you know, when we talk about the interrelatedness of Christ and the dragon, we have this other program that's sort of like Michael slays the Satan, and then Jesus doesn't talk to Satan, and then um, Satan tempts Jesus and Jesus crucified. But what if the dragon myth, you know, if Jesus really is from this dragon line, wouldn't this be a great way to obscure how the, the story could play out? Because what if the, the cross is, is kind of like the dragon. It's the wings of the dragon. It's the man and the dragon, you know? And if we go back to this, uh, this Targaryen imagery, or even, the, even in, a, in a strange way, the dialogues between, um, let's say, the def destiny of the dwarves and Smog, and the dialogue between the hobbit, Bilbo and, and Smog, uh, you start to see that there is a, there's a dialogue happening between the dragons and humanity. and, and in the in the in we mortal beings, uh, and if we if we kind of place Jesus on the dragon bloodline, then it doesn't quite make sense to slay the dragon, right? Although Jesus is a sacrifice, like, but again, uh, if we were to retool that story, and maybe this is where we get into the Revelation view of it, but I'm thinking something a bit different than Revelation. It's not a resurrection; it's more like the idea of. Uh, this bloodline of the dragon is something that you can superimpose over, like say for example, instead of the dragon, uh, Michael killing the dragon like in the fountain, Michael kills the weaker aspects of the shadow devil, right? But the dragons stand on, sort of uh, admiring him, or maybe even inspiring him, right? The dragons inspire this. So it's like Michael's strength, Michael is also winged, Right? So is Michael kind of a winged creature? Let me see in the cover of this. Two headed with dragon wings, right? And standing upon a dragon, right? And in other ways, it's also a Ouroboros in a strange way because there are dragons coming here. There's a dragon coiled, and there's a dragon wings, and there's a two headed, and there's a dragon about the wrist, right? This image is a. Uh, the resurrection of the united eternal body. It's a woodcut from Frankfurt, from the Rosarium Philosoph Philosophorum from 1550. And you can see that image is quite, quite interesting, right? And again, here we have this imagery 
in Lawrence Gardner's uh, Genesis of the Grail Kings with a dragon on the top of the cross, which is almost like an Ankh or a Venus with a dragon at the time. It's also Mercurius, right? If you put those two wings up, it's Mercurius. So the idea of this redemption of the dragon slaying myth or a recreation of it, I think it's a great exercise for uh, creative imagination. So, you know, for, for example, you could imagine, and maybe I'll do a separate episode on this, but you could imagine high, high level. Um, think of all of our prejudices, let's say, against dragon slaying. And what if we were to retool those as, uh, not as so much as alliances, but as, as, as maybe as St. Francis would, right? Think of St. Francis. I think he might have even mentioned about dragons, where, you know, the fear of an animal really means a lack of understanding in the in the human with compassion. So you know, like our, our Christ-like uh, a Christ-like approach to animals would be not one of that they are senseless beasts and that they are uh, un, in, incapable of soul, but more like, oh, this is another creation, this is another of God's creations. Now, would that we were to encounter a dragon? You know, a lot of things would go through your mind. First of all, those dragon riders had to be some tough characters, right? Those dragon riders must, they must have stepped down on the fear as Michael does, stepped down on the fear of that devil and defeated that fear so that they could mount that dragon, right? And, and so on. You could take this uh, creatively forward. But if you interweave it with, uh, which I think I'll do in a, in a, separate, a separate talk, if you interweave it with the, um, the Christian story, then you have a very fascinating uh, idea of perhaps the cross as the dragon's wings and Jesus perhaps being comforted by that power of the dragon. You know, because it's quite a, a triumphant act that he did, right? So very triumphant. So I don't know, this is, maybe this is a topic for uh, a fiction. It's not meant to uh, uh, be any kind of dogma, but it's more like the idea of questioning the found religions and found myth stories. And then using something like creative imagination, whether it's in world building, I think I'm going to do this as a sci-fi story. I mean, it'll be the dragons of Saturn or something like this, right? I think it'll be a cool idea. So um, uh, here's where we get to, you know, maybe the, a good place to stop. But the idea of it is uh, dragon bloodlines. We take it all the way up to uh, Dracula, which we will do another podcast on dragon and Dracula. Uh, if you guys are interested in that one. So the idea here is that bloodline supposedly persists all the way to today. And we've got some current events that are uh, related to that, right? So um, I think this would be an interesting to explore. And maybe if we do the deep dive on Gardner's, um, Gardner's trilogy of books, uh, we can get, get to that. There's also that overlap with the dragon bloodline and the and blood. You know, uh, Martin calls it fire and blood, right? So that you see in that alchemical uh, negredo, albedo, um, uh, there is a blood component too, right? So uh, part of the alchemical joy uh, voyage is to go from the the burnt to the pure to the blood to fire, sort of uh, consuming uh, all of the uh, the elements. And I think at that, we're going to, we're going to wrap it up with that. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, please check out the links below. Uh, I will be doing the dragon podcasts for the next few podcasts. So if you're interested in one of the topics I talked about below, please leave a comment. Uh, would like to jump into the uh, Genesis of the Grail Kings uh, books with you. I do want to do a, a, uh, an active creative imagination work where I've used some um, AI imaging to create some images of maybe transforming away from the dragon slaying myth uh, and and uh, take it from there. The, oh, the last point I kind of wanted to call, and it's very esoteric, but maybe I'll just, it's good to save it to the end. So if we question the dragon slaying, what does it mean to question the dragon as chaos, right? And I think this is very interesting uh, because, again, this kind of will probably be 
somewhat controversial, but uh, the idea here is, you know, we have Peterson going on about the chaos and the feminine and all of this, and it's quite, it's quite deep in all of this programming, let's call it, and it's, it's a Jungian archetype and for sure. But again, back to that St. Francis kind of quote about being kind toward the found animals and nature, having some kindness toward it. It also means a respect. One, one is not kind to the storming seas. If Tiamat is the storming saltwater seas, one knows not to go out in the sea on the storm or to be well equipped to face that, right? So we kind of have this responsibility. There's a personal responsibility in these stories. Uh, but one thing I think that's interesting about chaos, similar to the slight transformation of J Michael from a dragon slayer to Michael a purger of the devil while the dragons are sort of beside, or a tamer of dragons or a rider of dragons, right? If we could use that same creative, act, uh, creative thinking, suddenly chaos, isn't that just a lack of understanding the complexities of a higher order, of a higher order, right? So, you know, we have today something called uh, fractals and Mandelbrot sets and, and sort of theories that look at higher dimensional um, versions of our mathematics. And, and that chaos theory, although it's, uh, it's emergent and it's also uh, auto, automorphic, right? When a fractal generates a small bit of, of uh, a small function can automorphically generate a fractal. Uh, at the same time, it's not chaos as, as in without rules. It's chaos in like an alien complexity that we haven't fully... Uh, it's almost like a magical complexity, right? The, the chaos theory. So I, I want to kind of approach chaos in the dragon myth with a bit of revision as well because I just feel like, just like the abyss is always on a grayscale of light, right? There's always some light somewhere. Even the hope of light can give us some light, right? The, like, you know, Steiner talks about the inner vision as being a fourth dimension. If there were no light in three dimensions, one could still have the inner light at the fourth dimension, right? So I think that this gradation of grays uh, into the blackness makes it seem more connected to us all. And I think that this understanding of chaos, that it's uh, maybe something that's not so frightening, but it's just a matter of perspective and a matter of rules and a matter of um, allowing yourself to take steps back from it at times and then uh, zoom in in a, in a calculated way. Uh, I think that, that redefines a bit the myth of Tiamat as the, the, not only the mother of drags, but the mother of chaos. You know, if we take that back to the Greeks, now we're, we're in a very interesting space here, right? The interesting space here is that maybe chaos isn't as they told us it was. And is this just a hard stop for us to uh, not progress any further? But yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we can go into this more in details. Leave your questions below, guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. It was uh, fun putting it together. As you guys know, my, my process is really, I, I think about these things for a couple weeks up, up and uh, approaching. I do a little bit of note taking. I, I, I bookmark some books. But other than that, it's sort of like a live take on um, what I've thought about for the week. So I wouldn't call it a hot take per se, but it, it does kind of have that feeling. But, um, but yeah, I kind of like doing them this way. I think they come out, we come up with some gems doing it this way. And uh, I like to keep doing it. So if you guys are interested, uh, please check out the links, like and subscribe, ring the bell, you'll get notified when the next podcast comes out. As I mentioned, there are um, now the Pontos Fathom podcast is becoming book form. These will be available uh, by next year, but I'm starting to get proof copies of these already. There's just a lot to do from the speech to text conversion and, and adding some footnotes and things like that into them. So uh, you can check the progress and the Patreon below too. So thanks a lot for watching guys. It's been real fun. Uh, talk to you down in the comments and we'll see you next time as we continue our dragon series. Hope this was interesting and take care. Bye-bye.